Then he brought Israel out with silver and gold, and there was no one among their tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. God spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light by night. They asked, and God brought quails and gave them food from heaven in abundance. God opened the rock, and water gushed out of it. It flowed through the desert like a river. Today, in our, our worship online uh, and in person, if you choose to attend today, we are um, finding God liberating the Israelites, traveling across the sea to new life, to freedom, to liberation from bondage. And so today, consider how God has freed us from the bondage of this world, from the worship of idols, from slavery to sin and death, and the way God is continuing to work to liberate this world from those things. We will uh, meet on our Google Meet tonight at 6.30. Please join us. Um, we have such a fun time on there, and um, we study the Psalms, and it, and it brings out uh, joy when the Psalms bring out joy, and contemplation when they do, and, and I hope you will join us. As we begin to contemplate what God does and what God has done, would you pray with me? Take a moment to center your heart and enter into a contemplative space today. Grant, O Lord, that all who are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, your Son, may live in the power of his resurrection and look for him to come again in glory, who lives and reigns with you now and forever. Amen. As I mentioned, the scripture is going to come from Exodus, and, and for whatever reason, intricate reason, the lectionary um, skips over the plague, skips over all these acts of God's power. But in many ways, they are typified and exemplified when God parts the waters here in Exodus 14, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on the right and on the left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. All the morning, watching the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud, uh, looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He, God clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at dawn, the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses.
from one way of thinking, did God really do anything all that incredible? If we take a cynical view, I cross over the Haw River on dry land a couple times a week to go to Graham. In the town I grew up in, they separated the lake and the river with a berm dredged from uh, the, the mud on the bottom of the lake. They separated the land from the water, and I have walked across it. What used to be a lake, I have walked across on dry land. And um, when uh, hurricanes or, or storms uh, wash out part of uh, barrier islands like the Outer Banks, humans have regularly dredged and repaired them, built them back up so that there is dry land where there was ocean. Um, and, and humans have found all sorts of way to cross bodies of water, not just seas. But ancient people, before we can even understand how they did it, made it to Easter Island, to the Hawaiian Islands. People have always been seafaring. We've always been able to get across the water. Humans have done some incredible feats of engineering. People reverse the flow of the Chicago River. They reverse the flow of the river. People built the Panama Canal and the Erie Canal. And we separate land from the water all the time. We build dams so that people on one side are literally walking where water should be. Of course, I don't think this. What is incredible is not the bare facts of the act of God. But first of all, of course, God did it immediately. It didn't take God years and years to, to separate the waters. God just did it. But what's more important that makes this event different is what it signifies about God and the purpose for which God parted the waters. First, the significance should not be lost on us. The initial act of God in Scripture is separating the waters from the land. The God who showed up showed Egypt, as God did with all the plagues, this is not some God, this is the God of creation. The God who separated the waters from the land can do it again. And what's more, the significance of this is that God is making creation, is creating a nation by liberating them from Egypt. God continues to create. God didn't create once. If we're talking about God's action as we move through Exodus, God parts the waters. God still works to free us and to free people who have cried out. And what makes God's act different than any of these human acts? Is this why? God didn't build a bridge or put dry land there to improve commerce between Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. God didn't put the dry land there so that um, they might farm on the land or use it for tourism. God parted the waters to free the people God had made a promise with. The covenant God made is, what, is why God parted the waters. God parts the waters for salvation. And these waters part 
on a one-way street, the Israelites are saved and sent on a journey to the promised land. There's no going back. And what's more, by parting these waters, God takes pursuers, slave catchers, an army of people, uh, the greatest might in the world at that time, and turns them into a fleeing mass. This is what God does, transforms aggressors into people fleeing from God's power and turns slaves into a great nation through the water. And the Israelites are going to grumble a little bit. They're going to want to go back. But their lives have been changed in this moment. This singular act of God continues in the wilderness. And when they reach the promised land, God parts the waters of the Jordan. The same waters in which Jesus is baptized. The waters that God parts to bring people to salvation, to offer new life, to free people from oppressive powers is this water of our baptism. The water of the Red Sea, the water of the Jordan is our baptismal waters. When God pours out grace upon us in our baptism, whenever you were baptized. It was not just a nice symbol that God loved you. It was not just a sign that you were part of a church. It was a singular act of God that you were offered new life, that, that you had been freed from slavery to sin and death and offered a new life that we had been remade in the image of God, that's our baptism. It is our liberation, our membership in a new kingdom. Now, sometimes we end up grumbling, even though we've been baptized. Sometimes we want to turn away. But in our baptism, God poured out grace upon us and said, I am not giving up on you. And our baptisms have led to all this. The life of this community, our service to the world, and our pursuit of righteousness against all the idols and oppressors in this world. So would you reaffirm your baptism today? Would you remember what God has brought you to, the new life that was offered at your baptism, and that continues to work and call us to ministry and service. Would you renew your baptism today? Brothers and sisters in Christ, through baptism, we are incorporated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through the water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If you do, say, I do. Lord, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Lord, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? People of God, say, I do. Lord, I do according to the grace given to you. Will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? 
Lord, we will. And would you join me, even on video, in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments with the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the God, the Father Almighty, and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you pray with me? Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit, God. And by this gift of water, call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you have washed away our sins and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Friends, find some water. Pour it out. Remember your baptism and be thankful that God has brought us to new life and empowered us to be part of the resurrection and the new life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. This baptism, it's working on us our whole lives. It is the foundation of our lives of faith and holding on to it, remembering it, as you might have known since I've probably remembered our baptism four or five times since I've been in this church, is important. It is the primary calling on our lives and our rebirth through water and the Spirit is, is the anchor of our faith through Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. And so as a baptized people, as a people liberated, pray today for a world that is oppressed by evil, that is overshadowed by darkness, and that needs new life more than anything. Friends, our conference lost this week Gary Locklear, our former lay leader, uh, a person I did not know well, but even in his death has been an incredible witness to the life of baptized Christians. I hope you will pray for him and his family. And we pray for today for all those who are ill with COVID-19 and ill with other things amidst it, for all those who are lonely. And we give thanks today for the new life we have received in Jesus Christ, that, that there is resurrection and there is life. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I won't sing again at you today.
but as you go out into the world today and this week, remember the words of that song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, go forth. And as a baptized people, go and follow Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.